This is former All Pro Dolphin Lyman Richmond Webb, and you're listening to The Grueling Truth. Welcome to The Grueling Truth's NFL Legends Show, brought to you by Gridiron Mo, a new interactive football app. Um, make sure you check it out. You can call the plays during a live NFL game compared to what everybody else does. And they have a trivia show that they do during the off season. So make sure you check out Grid Armo. Um, also check out Steelberg Box at www.steelbergbox.com. As always, I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I want to welcome in my co-host, Matt Andrews Cabbage. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. Looking forward to talking to uh, one of the great players in NFL history. All right. Um, our guest tonight was one of the top linebackers in the decade of the 1990s, including being named the 1995 NFL Defensive Player of the Year, 17 and a half sacks. Help me welcome to the Grilling Truth, Bryce Paul. All right. Thanks for having me. Hey, great to have you, Bryce. Um, Glad to be here. Off, tell, us, tell us a little bit about your younger years. I know you were born and raised in Iowa. When did you start playing football? What were some of your early influences? Uh, I started playing football in seventh grade, and um, I still remember waking up that morning in the fall morning and having my jersey laid out nice and neatly on the dresser because we got to wear them to school, and still remember walking down to the field for that first game. And, uh, you know, one of my earliest memories is of uh, the Dallas Cowboys because uh, my my dad and my oldest brother uh, liked the Cowboys, and so I just became a Cowboys fan, and that was back when Roger Staubach and, and Tony Dorsett, Drew Pearson, Randy White, you know, all those guys were playing. What made you choose to uh, play college football in northern Iowa? <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't have much of a choice. Um, coming out of high school, um, you know, a school by the name of Graceland, uh, Division Two school came up, and uh, and they said I was their top prospect in in uh, you know in the state. And I was kind of like, wow, that's. Uh, I kind of laughed inside. I thought, how do they even know? You know, because. Uh, I uh, grew up in a really small town. I graduated 19 kids in my class. Uh, last game my senior year, we only had one guy on the sidelines. And, you know, we won three games, um, and we actually took one of those mini buses to the games, you know. So uh, I didn't have a lot of options when I was uh, coming out of high school. Iowa and Iowa State said thanks but no thanks. And so, uh, you know, my wife was actually – a year older than me in school, and she had already gone to uh, northern Iowa, and I didn't even know anything about northern Iowa. I didn't even know it existed, to tell you the truth, <laughs> until she went there and, and then found out they played pretty good football. And, and then my high school coach, um, you know, um, got a hold of them and, and started heading me in that direction. So let's talk a little bit about your years at northern Iowa. What were those years like? What were some of your most memorable moments at northern Iowa? Uh, you know what, um, I guess, you know, not even knowing about Northern Iowa or anything was a good thing because I was so, I guess, naive and young and dumb that I didn't know that I should be nervous or worried about the level of football I was going into. Um, you know, it was just football. Um, and I remember, uh, I got asked to play in the, uh, Iowa Shrine game. And so I played in that and, this kid from Des Moines um, uh, was an elite uh, class 4A, elite all state. You know, whatever you could you could give him, he got um, defensive end. And I don't know, I played middle linebacker and whatever else that uh, we needed that week. And we had one coach and an assistant if he didn't have anything better to do. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of my coaching was there's the ball, go get it. And so, you know, playing D-line, didn't really have any idea of what I was doing. Got put at D-line um, in the Shrine game and actually beat that kid out, um, you know, and, and started the game. And, and uh, you know, I just I thought that that was interesting, you know, and, and my whole concept or thought was, well, <laughs> If I can do it, anybody can do it, you know, because 
who am I? I'm from a small town and, you know, graduated with 19 people. You know, my last game my senior year, we had one guy on the sidelines. If a kid from this school can do it, anybody can do it. And, uh, you know, I just, I guess I was that naive and young um, and I didn't know any better, which was a good thing because, you know, I stepped in and, and started running around offensive tackles and, and they were like, wow. And they actually started um, thinking that maybe I could play my freshman year, and so I did redshirt. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, kind of overwhelming to a certain degree that first year. You know, I was drinking out of a fire hydrant, and, uh, you know, it was, it was good. And uh, now I look back on it, I'm not even sure we'd recruit myself if, uh, you know, if I was out there now. Well, in 1990, you're headed to the NFL draft. And uh, what what are you what do you remember about uh, your draft day experience, and what were your initial thoughts about going to Green Bay? Uh, <laughs> again, didn't know much of anything about Green Bay. Um, I had watched a game uh, that year uh, because the Packers were pretty good that year. They won ten games and beat the Chicago Bears, I think, twice. First time that happened in a long time. Uh, and so I'd watched them, and you know they. At that time, they played half of their games down in Milwaukee. And, you know, I happened to see one of the games that was in Milwaukee. And, uh, you know, they showed uh, Lake Michigan out there. And so I just thought, you know, okay, it's on the water. You know, I just assumed that that was their home, and that was Green Bay. And that was actually Milwaukee. And, um, you know, I, uh, I guess I was, again, um, kind of naive and young um, and didn't know what I didn't know. And we played actually the same defense as the Packers did. I mean, same terminology and everything because they're, the defensive coordinator here at Northern Iowa coached with the defensive coordinator at Green Bay at the time. And so when I walked in there, um, I had the terminology down, which is huge. You know, if you if you can walk in and speak the same language – and go to a new environment, that is huge. And, you know, um, during some uh, mini camps, I was actually answering questions that some of the veterans didn't know, and they were looking at me like, who in the heck is this? Where did this guy come from? Um, you know, <laughs> so I got, a, I got kind of a, a jump start on everybody, and, and you know, it just uh, kind of snowballed from that. One, one of my earliest memories and things that kind of stood out was, Cleveland Browns at the time came in for a pregame scrimmage, and then we played them. I, I believe it was the first preseason game my rookie year. And Brian Noble at the time, um, you know, he's a, a veteran, and and he could dictate when he wanted to practice and when he didn't. And you know, we got to a uh, oh a goal line drill, and he decided <laughs> he didn't want to participate. So threw me in there, and I made just about every play. And then I got the idea, hmm, maybe I belong. Maybe I can do this thing. You know, and it gave me confidence, and then the ball started rolling again, and, you know, just one thing led to another, and I was very fortunate that they decided to keep me. Now, your first training camp, well, as you talk, you go in as a six-round draft pick. Uh, You talked about when you first realized when you could play at that level. Were there any players that kind of helped you along, any veterans that kind of took you under their wing? Well, Brian Noble did. You know, um, I guess since I was taking a bunch of his reps, he, he decided to give me some knowledge, and, which was awesome because there were certain plays that were, were hard for me, you know, like the, uh, the power, uh, because I would be so aggressive. You know, when that guard blocked down, I was up in his grill right now. You know, I was going to go and, you know, slam that guard so he couldn't climb on me, and I would get ear holed by the tackle or the tight end coming down, you know, on the front side, and I could never figure out. And he played it. I mean, he'd take a, a little bit of read step, and then he'd scrape outside the tight end and blow up the fullback and make the play, and I just could not figure out how he'd do that. And so then he started showing me, <clears throat> okay, when they come down at a sharp angle, it's it's not a play that's going to be, you know, um, going away from you. That's 
you know, that's a slam block and you got to scrape outside. So then I started paying attention, started to pay attention to that. And, and that was really my last big hurdle uh, to where I could feel comfortable. And so, um, you know, I, I took a bunch of reps, which actually gave me an opportunity to show what I could do. And, and he, you know, gave me the knowledge and the ability to study. And, uh, you know, he, he, I'm forever grateful because uh, basically he showed me uh, how to make the team. Well, 1990 and 91 were definitely some uh, tougher years for the Packers, but things started to turn around after uh, in the 92 season, and uh, for the next few years we're uh, definitely looking upward. What were some of your fondest memories uh, in your playing time with the Packers? Well, um, part of it was, you know, they got Reggie White and Brett Favre and, you know, just being able to be there to start to turn the worm because, you know, the fans were awesome, but we just weren't very good. You know, my second year we were 4-12. and 12. That was terrible. Um, you know, and a lot of people got let go and, and uh, you know, it was just a hard time, especially when Holmgren and Wolf came in because <clears throat> uh, it <laughs> There was new people coming in every Monday. There was somebody new in the locker room, and you were just hoping on Monday morning that you walked in there and saw your name on the locker. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, those were the, the scary hard times that you go through in transition. But when the worms started to turn, we started to win. You know, it was just an awesome place to be. You know, the, the town started to come alive, you know, the fans, and it was just a, a great place to play because they – you know, they hadn't been good for a long time, and we started to win, and they started to believe, and it was just uh, a really good time. All right. Now, you played there through the 94 season. Mm-hmm. 95 comes along. And I know Packers GM Ron Wolf has said before or seen before where he said he made a major miscalculation letting you go. Was there any animosity when you left Green Bay for Buffalo? Yeah, I was not happy about that. I, um, you know, small-town kid I wanted to say to stay in the small town I wanted to be there when they won the Super Bowl because I knew you know how passionate those people were and how long it had been since they'd been good uh so I was not happy about it but you know I, I can't can't gripe too much it worked out for both of us they had to get rid of me so they could win the Super Bowl and I had to leave so that uh somebody could finally use me the way you know to so that I could become uh, you know, better because Green Bay would n- never have given me the opportunity that Buffalo did. They saw me in a totally different light. And, you know, sometimes that's what it takes is is somebody to believe in you and then, you know, say, okay, you're a guy and we need you to produce. And, and when they did that, you know, the things just came together and, you know, it was uh, – great time uh you know I, I can't complain buffalo treated me well and i had great experience there when you got to the bills they had just hired uh wade phillips who's obviously still one of the top defensive coordinators can mm-hmm. you tell us a little bit about the impact that wade phillips had on your career yeah wade was uh, you know it was a funny story you know i was always uh, you know, wasn't used to calling coaches by their names. You know, it was always coach. And so when when I would see him, and I would say, hey, coach, and he'd say, hi, player. <laughs> That's bizarre, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, you know, he was like that. He liked to joke around. Uh, but he, he just turned me loose. He said, you know what, we need you to produce. We think you can do it and we're going to let you go. And Ted Cottrell was, um, you know, my, my position coach, and, and they basically gave me the freedom to get it done. They said, I don't care where you line up. At the snap of the ball, you've got to be in this gap. And that was, that was awesome for me to give me that kind of freedom that I could start messing with the guys because what I'd start doing in Green Bay was, you know, during practice I would try moves on on people and then I would ask them after the play, why did that work uh, when this didn't work? And they would tell me, okay, well, I'm coached like this and when you do this, I react like this. So once I started figuring out how they were coached, I could use that against them. 
And so that's what I did. I took that knowledge that I gained the year before without them turning me loose, and then I was able to use that against offensive players. You know, not everybody's going to be coached exactly the same, but the principles are the same. And so I was able to use that, and they basically said, okay, have at it. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, – a great experience, and, and Wade did a great job of, uh, you know, turning me loose and, and calling my number a lot, and, you know, it, it worked out. I was very fortunate and blessed to be a part of it. Now, in 1995, you accumulated 17 and a half sacks, um, named the NFL Defensive Player of the Year. What are some of your best memories from that season? Oh, um, <laughs> I we, the first game that kind of started the ball rolling that year was when we played Indy in Buffalo, and um, oh, what was it? Uh, Tony Bennett was um, with Indianapolis, and he was um, you know with me in Green Bay. He got drafted in the first round. We had two first round draft choices: Daryl Thompson and Tony Bennett. Well, Tony went to Indianapolis, and um, we were playing them, and that morning. Uh, I actually picked him up at his hotel and took him to the stadium, and we were able to talk. And, and um, you know, uh, that game was kind of my coming out because I had, like, three sacks that game, and, you know, um, just kind of the ball started rolling at, on that game. And, um, you know, it was just one of those things that, uh, you know, just – was kind of the stars aligning and and it started to roll and uh uh after that sometimes you get i guess you get a little more respect and people are worried about you then and so you can really get in people's heads when that starts to happen and uh you know that's one of the one of the good or better memories the other one was um the last game of the year we were playing um I think they were still the Houston Oilers at the time. might have been Titans. But anyway, it was like McNair's rookie year. And, you know, I, I had 17 and a half sacks, and we were playing that game. We didn't need the game, and I was ready to go. I wanted to go out and, you know, try to get at least 20 sacks. And they deactivated me for the game, and I was kind of frustrated with that. But, uh, you know, they wanted to save me uh, for the playoffs. and. You know, that's one of one of a couple of memories that kind of sticks out from that year. Um, you know, but it was just fun. Um, once once it started to roll, it uh, you know it was just a, a blast, and you know played with a bunch of good guys. And you talk about playing with good guys. You know, a couple of your teammates, uh, Hall of Famers Reggie White and Bruce Smith, some of the best pass rushers, best defensive ends the game will ever see. What was it like playing with those guys? You know what? Um, they were totally different, but you know they produced about the same. I think Bruce Smith got Reggie by I don't know a handful of sacks or maybe one. I'm not sure. I don't remember what the totals are. But you know Reggie White was just just a freak, um, a great guy. You know in the locker room, great human being. But he'd go out there and he'd just wreak havoc on people, toss them. You know, he he wouldn't have been a good coach because I asked him because I I studied his game and actually got the um, hit toss or the hump move from him and used that and I used that in coaching too and you know I asked him well how do you do that what do you look for well you come up there and you just do this oh uh, okay <laughs> that helps <laughs> um, but you know he was just such a great natural, you know, um, athlete and, and natural guy that, or football player that, you know, he didn't know exactly how to do it. He, he could just do it. And then you go to Bruce Smith, who was kind of the opposite end. You know, he was, you know, everybody thinks he was huge. He was about 6'2", six, 6'2 two, six, two maybe, about 265. And he was a contortionist. Uh, had great body control, and that's why he could rush the passer so well uh, because <clears throat> his legs would be going straight ahead, and he, he could be bent at the waist and twisted his body at a 90-degree angle, um, you know, to his legs and still make it through. It was just amazing how he could contort his body and still have the ability to make it through. Um, 
Uh, so he was fast, he was strong, um, and, uh, you know, didn't talk to him a, a whole lot. Um, you know, by that time his career was pretty set and he had a family and, you know, I had a family and I, I didn't, uh, mingle too much off the field with, uh, with a lot of guys there, but, um, you know, he, he always showed up and, and played and you knew that, um, you know, you were going to have a, a great presence on the other side, whether it was Reggie or Bruce. Yeah. Now you left the bills for Jacksonville in 1998. Can you tell us what led you to that decision? Uh, Cause you've been so <laughs> successful in Buffalo. Yeah. Well, um, there's a couple things, and, and they they had just got a new uh, GM. Um, I think he came, where did he come from? Pittsburgh, maybe? Donahue, I believe, was the name. Um, yeah. And he was calling our bluff. He, he said, well, they don't have that kind of an offer, you know, because it came right out of the gate. And so he called our bluff, and, you know, if I turn that kind of money down, then people are like, well, what does he want? Um, because right away I became the highest paid linebacker in the NFL at that time. And, you know, if I turn that kind of money down, that's going to scare people off. And, uh, you know, it was right out of the gate. I mean, the opening morning of free agency, I mean, it was on the table. Um, and, um, you know, and they, they thought, well, he doesn't have that. They're just playing games with us. And, you know, what are you going to do if they won't, they won't come to the table, what are you supposed to do? Uh, it was kind of like when I left Green Bay. They said, you know what, we can't match that. They didn't give me an opportunity to tell them, no, I don't want that, I want more. They just said, we can't match that. And so both times I was off. Um, and, you know, uh, I'll put it this way, money does not make you happy. Let's put it that yeah. way because – when I went to Jacksonville, they used me completely different, and I still, to this day, scratch my head what happened. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. Um, and it uh, you go through things in your life that uh, make you a better person. It didn't make me uh, better in my career, and I think it actually hurt me uh, uh, quite a bit in my career. Um, but in the long run, it changed me and made me, stop and think of who I was, where I was going, and made me fundamentally change the direction of my life uh, because football was was out of control, um, you know, because I had no say in how they played me. I produced the same exact numbers my first year in Jacksonville as that I had in Green Bay when I went to the Pro Bowl my first time, but I was a, a complete bomb because I didn't have the numbers that I had in Buffalo. Uh, but they didn't play me like I, you know, like they played me in Buffalo. So what are you going to expect? And so that just kind of snowballed and got out of hand. And then before my second year in, in Jacksonville, I tore my pec lifting. And, you know, that was uh, uh, should have had surgery and should have stayed out that year. I chose not to because I had a physical therapist that kind of walked me through that whole thing. I mean, uh, my whole arm turned purple from the tears, like 75% tear. should have had surgery, but, you know, that night I was actually doing exercises, lifting my arm clear up back against the wall so that I wouldn't scar down. And missed a month, but then came back and played because I knew we had a great team and I wanted to be a part of it. If, if we went to the Super Bowl. And unfortunately, we didn't. We made it to the AFC Championship game. We got beat by Tennessee three times in one year. How often does that happen? But, you know, uh, that's the way it goes. But, uh, you know, so that's kind of what happened in, in Jacksonville. And, you know, all of a sudden I became a big bust. And, you know, there was things out of my control that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, just happened. Well, you played for uh, Mark Levy in Buffalo and in Jacksonville. Tom Coughlin was coach. Can you talk a little bit about those two coaches? Because on the surface, they seem like total, complete opposite uh, personalities. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I... <sighs> Marv was awesome to play for. I mean, if you did your job and you produced, he left you alone. Uh, coach Coughlin was complete opposite, you know, and uh, I'm just going to 
say this one thing. Um, rules without relationship lead to rebellion, and that's exactly what happened down there, um, you know, with everybody. Uh, treated you, you know, he was paranoid that people were going to screw him, and there's an ancient proverb that says, what you dread or fear will come upon you, and that's exactly what happened to him. And that's why he couldn't win. We should have we should have won the Super Bowl that year, uh, but his paranoia and his dictatorship caused everyone. You know, when I first got down there, the guy said, "When we get the playoffs, my first year, hey, it's a win-win." I'm like, "What do you mean? Hey, if we win, we make more money. If we lose, we don't have to put up with him for a long time." <laughs> you know, uh-huh. and that just floored me. Um, but, you know, eventually you get to that point. But I will say this about him. He did change. He had to have changed. Otherwise, he would never have won, uh, you know, like he did in, in um, at the Giants. And, you know, hats off to him, you know. Everybody goes through a humbling period that, that uh, you know, you have to change in life. And, and he did it and successfully changed. So, you know, uh, I went from almost hating him to, you know, admiring him at the end. Um, I, I couldn't have said that, you know, when I left Jacksonville, but over the years, you know, time heals, you know, over the years, and, and you start to, you know, start to pull for the guy. And, uh, you know, I never thought I'd ever say that, but, uh, you know, that, that happens over the years, I guess. All right, now, after retiring, I know you went into coaching. You coached high school football for a while and college football. Can you tell what led to that decision, and is there anybody that you played for that you find yourself kind of emulating or taking a lot of what he did while you were playing for him? Uh, Coaching, yeah, I kind of backed into that one. Um, Because my whole career, I never – I was never going to coach, you know, I was going to make a name for myself outside of football after football and, you know, started doing different business ventures, built houses for a while. And, you know, it, for whatever reason, that just, it wasn't my cup of tea. I mean, I, I like doing stuff with my hands, but, you know, got involved with, uh, with different things and, and it just didn't work out. And so, um, uh, after about three years of trying this, that, and the other thing, um, the local high school uh, that was basically in my backyard in, in the Green Bay area, the, they they found out that I lived in the area and they asked if I wanted to coach. And, and you know, the coach, the head coach came to my door and, and unfortunately or maybe fortunately I wasn't home and, and the head coach asked her if, if I'd want to coach and she, she said, sure. <laughs> so, so I was off, and my son was eventually going to go to that that school and play there. So I wanted to have a you know a say in in what uh, you know what his experience was going to be like, and you know that was a eye opening experience. Starting to coach and and see what some of the um, younger coaches or youth coaches, what they actually do and believe and teach the kids. That was, uh, I'll say this, I would never let my kid, and I didn't let my kids play uh, until seventh grade tackle football because to me, there's just, this concussion thing I think is spiral partially because it's it's one of those things that, um, you know, it's accumulation. You know, there's damage because of accumulation. Well, um, who knows how many concussions these little kids get, you know. And yeah, before the brain's even developed. Right. And and who's to say that, uh, you know, it, it's not bad? We I don't know. And who is fitting these helmets? A lot of these little kids that I see, their helmets aren't even fitted correctly. That's why you get a concussion because it's too sloppy. When I started to coach and I became the head coach, no one else fit the helmet. I fit every helmet. If you were going to have a helmet change, I was fitting it because, you know what, if I was going to be responsible, you know, those kids were going to be fit right. I wasn't going to stick my name or my neck out there and have somebody just slap a helmet on and, oh, yeah, it looks good, and take off. And it took hours to fit, you know, 120 to 150 kids, depending on the year. But, you know what, to me, that was the most important thing. Football 
should not maim people. You know, if you do it right and if you're out for, you know, you can win and still look out for the kids because we did it at that high school. And, um, you know, we eventually, um, well, I, I coached as a as an assistant for three years and then, you know, um, had a mutual parting and I went to another school and they, they needed a head coach and, you know, it's funny how things work out sometimes. God lit the house on fire and opened up a door and said, if you're going to coach, that's the only place, and you're going to be the head coach. I was like, oh, my goodness. That's not what I wanted to be. I never wanted to be a head coach or never wanted to coach, and then I didn't want to be a head coach, and that's all I had. You know, and then my kid would come over and play there. Um, and so, you know, part of it, too, was I had, I had coached those kids in junior high um, because of the city team. And so the kids at that new school, I had already coached them. And it was a really good group. And so, you know, I kind of had familiarity with them and they did with me. And so it was kind of a natural fit. And holy cow, I guess I should have paid attention more when I was an assistant coach because when I got there, it was uh, – we won the first game I ever was the head coach at, but it was a comedy of errors. You know, I, I had – my uh, my middle linebacker has the uh, the wrist brace, you know, bracelet on there, and has all the calls on it. I opened my book right before the game, uh, and I left my sheet in the coach's office. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm just calling, pulling them out of my behind. Um, you know, I, I knew it, and I knew how to you know, to do it, but I didn't know what the calls were on the sheet, so I just, at the spur of the moment, I had to come up with signals, you know, and yell them out and, you know, couldn't talk the next day. But anyway, we got through that. And then the guy up in the box, I told him, chart the offense because I want to know what's going on. So I'm asking him as as the, you know, the game is going, what they're doing on offense. And, and he can't can't really give me anything specific and I'm thinking well I asked you to chart it and what are you doing you know um, well I think they're doing this I think they're doing that well if you're charting it you should know exactly what they're doing and so at halftime he comes down and I go okay uh, what's their offense doing you've been charting it right he goes oh I've been charting our offense (laughs) oh okay uh, so there was a whole bunch of different things like that that, uh, you know, th- that happens when you assume. And, uh, you know, it got past that. And, and um, you know, there's a lot of things that happened uh, that I could bore you with for probably two hours. But uh, let's put it this way. I kind of I finally figured out that you can't just um, yell at them, hey, take the bull by the horns. you got to coach them. you got to show them how to lead. And because if if you want them to tackle, you can't tell them, hey, tackle, and never show them how to do it and never practice it. you got to show them how to do it, teach them how to do it before they're good at it. And, you know, Vince Lombardi said it the best, you know, um, and leaders aren't born, they're made. And how are they made? Because you instruct them, you teach them how to do it, and then you show them how to do it. And once once I finally figured that piece out, uh, you know, brilliant, uh, um, played football for 21 years and never could art- articulate that to my kids. But, uh, you know, it, that was just one of the concepts that, uh, you know, you had to learn, you had to teach, you know, because I, I learned that stuff as I was growing up, and, and I just assumed, you know, again, what happens when you assume, uh, that the kids would know what to do instinctively. Well, they don't. You know, they haven't had your experiences. And so, you know, once I figured that out and started teaching them and started you know, teaching them on character and stuff like that, the ball started rolling and that team just took off. And, you know, the more uh, the more we won and the later got in the year, the less I pounded them. I pulled back. And one of the consistent things I heard after games uh, from, from uh, other coaches in the school and administrators and, and just people was, wow, that was a physical game. That was almost a bludgeoning. And, you know, it just... Uh, I, I proved that you could, you know, um, win and not grind the kids during the week, and they would go out and be physical, you know. And 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And part of them, you know, giving it their all was because I was in it for them. If they were injured, you know, I made sure, kind of like Marv Levy. I took this from Marv Levy. Okay, I think I can go, Coach. Well, I'd watch him. No, you can't go. You're sitting out today. Well, I want to practice. No, you're fine. I don't need to see you today. I know what you can do. And so I took that from Marv Levy. Another thing I took from uh, Mike Holmgren was pulling back on pounding, you know, because he was, you know, when he first came into Green Bay, he pulled back on the hitting and, man, you were hungry to hit, um, you know, when it came to Sunday. And then Marv Levy, the same exact thing. You know, my first year in Buffalo, we hardly ever hit. We asked to put the pads on, and he would say no. You know, so I knew that you could win, and, and those kids would be chomping at the bit, and they'd be physical if you didn't pound them. And, you know, that was that was an awesome thing to see, that we, we could go out and play really physical football and not grind those kids. And, you know, I, I was always very conscious of those kids, you know, are you, know, are you okay? And if, if there was any hesitation, I'd watch them. If they couldn't go out and protect themselves, they were out of the game. I didn't care. You know, one of the guys that's playing for the Seattle Seahawks, I coached at the first school, and, um, you know, he actually came into camp way too heavy, and I told him, hey, you've got to lose weight because you're going to get hurt because he gained like 30 pounds and just fat. And uh, so I made him start losing weight, and sure enough, fourth game into the season, he was too heavy and couldn't get out of the way, and he broke one of the uh, bones in his lower leg. Well, the trainer, you know, he, he, you don't have x-ray vision. You can't tell. So he taped his ankle up, and he went out there, and I was watching him, and he was limping so bad he was going to blow his knee out. He couldn't get out of the way. And finally, I just said, you're out. You're done. And come to find out, he had broke his, broken his leg, and if I had made him, you know, just let him stay out there, he probably would have had to have surgery. But the doctor said, since the coach, you know, pulled you out of the game, and saved you from having surgery. And so, you know, to me, it's more about protecting those kids and looking out for their best interests. When they know you care for them, they're going to listen to you, and they're going to fight for you. Probably more than what you guys wanted to hear. But No, actually it wasn't. So <laughs> I completely agree all. with everything you said. And I have two younger sons. One of them's just now a freshman in high school. The other one's a seventh grader. And I feel the same way about the Pee Wee football stuff. And, and you know yourself, you played high school football in the 80s. I mean, high school mm -hmm. football practice in the 80s, I don't know about where you were, but everywhere around here, you would hit every day for two hours, two or three practices a day up until the season started. And, oh, I mean, yeah. I think people don't realize, I think most concussions come from practice. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And, you know, when I first got in the NFL, I can see why these older guys are having issues, you know, because when I first got in the NFL, I mean, it was ground and grind you until you couldn't go. I mean, we had two practices a day, full pads for two and a half, three hours, and it was just a marathon. You know, my first two years, and then Holmgren came in because at, at the beginning of my career, I thought, oh, my goodness, how are you ever going to last? How how do guys last this long? And, um, you know, I, I just wanted to play about four years, get a house paid for, get the money in the bank, have two cars paid for, and I was going to get out of there because it was just that bad. And then Holmgren came in, and all of a sudden, oh, this isn't quite so bad. You know, so uh, it, it's nice to see – that we've got some sense into it. And I think part of the issue was, you know, people didn't work out much in the off season before. And so that was a time to get them in shape. But, you know, it's kind of had a reverse effect too, because if you're not in shape and, uh, you know, part of the concussion deal is because you don't have a strong neck, you know. Um, if you have a strong neck, you're not going to get as many uh, concussions either. Um, and, um, you know, if you don't have a strong neck and you're pounding all the time, it's not going to hold up and you're going to get concussions. And in the older helmets, I still have my high school helmet. I mean, it has about an inch pad all the way around it, and it's hard as a rock. You know, <laughs> what was that? You know, that was just pounding your head against people. You know, there was no cushion there at all. And so I think, 
you know, the fact that, you know, you used to pound and they were out of shape and had bad equipment, and, um, I think that was a compound effect too. Uh, some of the newer helmets now are very good, you know, the, the speeds. Um, the kids in high school, man, they would get hit smacked right in front of me, and they were violent hits, and they'd get up, and I'd be like, hey, are you okay? I'd grab them first, you know, help them up and grab them. Hey, are you okay? Look in their eyes. Oh, I'm fine, coach. I'm like, wow, okay. So, you know, because the helmets that I played in, a lot of them, you get hit like that, and you'd be being pretty good. You know, you bring up the uh, concussion issue. What's your opinion of how the NFL has handled it, and uh, what, what, what else could they be doing to help uh, some of their older players? Well, you know, I think, okay, so you figured this out maybe a long time ago. I don't know when they did or didn't. But, okay, if you want it, and I don't know, I, 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 I had a bunch of concussions. How many? I have no idea. You know, when I did the workers' comp deal, they, they had a question there, how many concussions have you had? I just wrote, I don't remember, because I can't, you know. Uh, partially being a smart aleck about it, too, but, you know, uh, I don't remember. But one of the things I think they can do is help these guys. I've been told that there's places that you can go to exercise your brain and to help you know, keep it engaged and keep it, you know, fluid. Use it. Part of the part of the deal, I think, with some of this concussion stuff is we were never meant to sit around all the time. You know, we were made to go out and conquer. And when you sit around all the time, you know, the serotonin levels go up and testosterone goes down and you become depressed. Well, if you have guys that maybe have chemical imbalances because they've been smacked in the head so many times, um, sitting there getting more depressed, you know what? It's a recipe for disaster. You know, because part of the issue with with guys after they get done, they're like a deer in the headlights. They don't have to do anything, but you know what? Life is coming downhill at them, and if you don't get out of the way, you're going to get run over because people don't care who you used to be. You know, the the diapers need changed, the garbage needs taken out, you know, somebody's got to pay the bills, and and so you're there. You don't have to do anything but you have to do something, you know, and, and your colleagues, say your teammates in college that didn't make it to the NFL or your classmates are, you know, 11 years up the rung. And what did you do for 11 years? I pounded people and got paid for it. Well, what kind of carryover does that have to a, an office job or some other kind of job? Nothing. And so, you're afraid to go ask because, you know, then you're going to have to show them that you don't have any experience and you're going to have to stay or start at the the bottom of the rung and it's going to be a struggle to get back up to the top and everybody knows you're successful. What happens if they figure out that I'm not good at this and I'm a failure and, you know, fear of failure. And and so they, they don't do anything. It's just kind of a snowball effect. Well, you know, it takes three to five, maybe even seven years to get make the transition. And they need to be there and help those guys make that transition. And um, there's a program that I took called Life Skills, and it, it helps people with, with traumatic experiences from childhood because when, when you're a kid and you have something traumatic happen to you, you go into the fight or flight, and the adrenaline switch gets gets kicked on and you live in survival mode the rest of your life. And that's what makes you a great football player. But you know what? When you're done playing football, it makes you um, a trigger-happy dad and husband. And that's not good because somebody will say something and you're set off like that. You're ready to fight because you know what? That's the way you've been conditioned. Well, okay, let's train these guys how to get out of that, how to ratchet that that uh, idol back so that we can survive outside of the game. And there are programs out there that are able to do that if they would just spend the money and help these guys go through that. Part of the deal, too, is, you know, 
we are afraid because we're prideful, we're not going to ask for help. So part of that is our own problem or fault, but I think a lot of it has to do with the NFL because if they were really worried about them and, and really wanted to take care of the guys, they'd already have a program in place. Yeah, and, I mean, the thing is, as much money is brought into the NFL, that all started from the guys that played, you know, in the 19, 1980s and before. And those right. are the guys that it doesn't seem like they take care of. The players playing today seem to think they're invincible, and that will never happen to them. They don't worry about the guys before them. So it's all kind of a cyclical thing that just kind of repeats itself. Right, right. And you know what? Uh, all of us are eventually going to die. But do we think about it? No. For the most part, we don't until something catastrophic happens. Well, you're the same way as a player. You, you Eventually, you're going to walk through that door for the last time. But you never think about it. You never want to. You never want to talk about your own mortality. And you know it's it's the same with with those young men. They're they're invincible until they're not, and then they don't know how to cope with it. And I think you know if you're making that kind of money, you need to help take care of them. You know whether it's holding back a percentage of the money um, from their salary to to help them. You know with um, getting trained or whatever it is, there's things they can do to help them transition and, and be successful if they really want to. They're going to have to eventually. Otherwise, it's going to come to a, you know, there's going to be such an uproar that they're, they're either going to have to fold or they're going to have to do something. And I would rather see them do something right now well, they can still salvage it and show, you know, show people, hey, we do care about these guys, and, and we can take care of them. Because if they don't, you know, to me it was like when uh, Borland uh, retired because of concussions, and then ESPN was all over that. I was like, what are you doing? You're cutting your own throat. Because if you, if you magnify this concussion deal and how bad it is, you're cutting your own throat. That's your main source of money, and you're putting that all over the screen. You know, so to me, it's the same as the NFL. If if that's happening, then they better start doing something behind the scenes to solve this problem. And they can help solve it for college players uh, as well as NFL players. But, yeah, but don't you think a lot of this has to do with people watch the game? So you're watching the Super Bowl. And I don't think that people really realize that the players on the field that they're watching on TV actually have families in real lives. I think that they've been magnified so much in society. It's like they're superheroes. It, but when they're done, they're just replaced by another guy. Right, right. Because you never see what happens to guys when they're done. You know, they just disappear. And then 10 years afterwards, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, I knew he was a jerk because he, you know, he does something stupid or whatever or all of a sudden he shows up doing something or dying or whatever. That's, you know, they never, they never think of them. They never see them again, hardly. And so yeah, and with the NFL, mind, if it don't affect their profit, they don't really care. Right, exactly. And, you know, I'm not, and I'm not bashing the NFL, uh, you know, to, to ruin them. I just think they need to think about this and start doing something for somebody. Why do you, well, you know, to me, why, why am I coaching? It's not because I need the money, and I don't need to be away from my family, and I don't need to be raising someone else's kids. But you know what? I have a, money doesn't make you happy. You have to have a passion to get you out of bed. And my passion is helping people. I finally figured that out. And so that's what drives me. It's not about making money. It's not about winning games. That will come if I help people, all that, that's just a fringe benefit of helping people get to where they want to go and treating people right. And I think if they would have that concept, it would be totally different. Okay, we're almost out of time for the hour. Matt, you got any more questions? I don't have any more questions, but I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said, Bryce. And uh, it's unfortunate that the NFL doesn't have the same attitude that you do, because otherwise a lot more good would be happening. But uh, I'd just like to say it was an honor to have you. Very uh, grateful for you uh, spending some time with us tonight, and uh, I enjoyed uh, watching you play. Well, I appreciate you having me, and, and, and thanks for uh, 
I don't know who all listens or will hear this, but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to, to speak to people. Hey, Bryce, same thing Matt said. And the, the thing that really bothers us is we've interviewed guys like George Visger. I uh, don't know if you know who George is or not, but George Visger played for the 49ers and the Jets for a little bit early 80s. Matt Blair, the great linebacker for the Vikings. And yep. the, thing these, the things these guys have to go, do, go through just to get disability from the NFL – is almost criminal in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And I I think that I know Brian Noble, the guy who who helped me, you know, his back is all screwed up. And I know I can see the play vividly in my mind of when it got screwed up and it's like pulling teeth to get the NFL to cover it. Yeah. And it looks like they'd want to take care of their own, but they've turned into such a massive corporation. There's not too many big corporations in this country or this world that really worry about taking care of their workers anymore. All right, right. And it's a shame because, you know what, you reap what you sow eventually. If you're that stingy, people are going to be the same to you. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I want to remind everybody to check out the Grilling Truth Facebook page. Check us out on Spreaker, iTunes, Stitcher. Tomorrow night, our guest will be Toy Cook, former San Francisco 49er, New Orleans Saint. Uh, make sure you check out our Super Bowl 50 review show last night with Leon Searcy, who always talks about how hard you were to block. said he hated to play Buffalo, Wade Phillips' defense, but you and Bruce Smith. Um, Leon joined Matt and myself on the show with former Pittsburgh Steeler Gary Dunn and former Denver Bronco Mark Cooper. So make sure you get a chance to check that out. In the coming weeks, we'll have interviews with former Los Angeles Ram Tony Hunter, former Kansas City Chief J.J. Burden, um, and then Mark Cooper told us we, uh, he's going to be able to get us Ted Hendricks here pretty soon also. So make sure you check all those out. But, Bryce, once again, it was an absolute honor to talk to you. I think you're a linebacker that I loved to watch when I was growing up. And, like I said, it was an honor to have you on the show. Well, thank you. I I appreciate you guys having me and letting me feel important for an hour. You bet. All right. Uh, Very glad to have you. Thank you. Yep. So, also, what are you doing today? You got anything you want to, any fundraiser, anything you want to promote? Or I know you're coaching at the University of Northern Iowa. Uh, No real fundraiser, just – I don't know. I just, uh, like I said, I have a passion to help kids. And, you know, my passion is I want to, I want to have a a program kind of like the high school based on, on helping young men, um, you know, become responsible young adults. You know, someday I want them to come back. I don't know how long I'm going to coach, but someday I'd like them to come back if I'm still coaching in 20 years and say, Hey coach, thanks. I have a successful career and family because of the principles you taught me while I was playing. And so that's that's the only thing I'm plugging is, um, you know, if, if people are out there coaching, hey, it's more about people developing people than it is about winning games. The games I'll will come. You. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you Absolutely. what, Brian. If everybody in this world plugged that, this world would be a much better place. Yep. No question. So, guys, make sure you check us out tomorrow night with Toy Cook. So, once again, I want to thank Bryce Pop. Matt Andrews Scavage, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.